Except it isn't. Especially because, and this is kind of bridging into the other part of it, there are topics you can talk about, even if you were someone maybe who experienced the PTSD. That is a very big, very difficult topic with a lot going into it. And you want to have the qualifications to talk about. That's something that doesn't really go in the game. That's something that goes into a therapy session. Better left to a professional psychotherapist. And too often, especially when we're talking about the difficult subjects in RPGs, like horror RPGs and things, people get those confused. And that can be a big problem because it can turn what is supposed to be a, a good game that helps people understand some things and maybe touches on some uh, deeper themes to a uh, tour trip through various traumas. And that's not okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, we're gonna. So the theme of this panel is gonna, is gonna touch on on the whole idea of the difficult topics in your in your games. Um, a lot of the panelists up here are using games in a therapeutic context. So I'll just I'll just iterate for everybody that you shouldn't do therapy on your friends or your family, uh, and that you shouldn't um, bring try to, try to do therapy in games if you are uh, not a therapist. So. Um, you know, speak to your background, speak to your to your training as it as it comes into those things. Um, but to add to the to the kind of difficult topics conversation with this, it, it it's okay to make games where you are you're going to have to navigate this. So part part of the challenge here of talking about difficult topics is you may make some intentional choices about what you want to address in games, and the kids in your games may bring up stuff that you don't know how to address. One of the most important things to take away is it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I'm not comfortable with, with, with this. I don't feel like I'm ready to, to handle this in the game. And it's okay as a game master, especially, and especially when you're working with kids, to say, hmm, this is a difficult and challenging subject. And for the purposes of our game, and making sure that we're having a good time, and making sure that we're getting along well, I think we're going to have to figure out how we can set some boundaries about, about trying to navigate this together. And to speak to really add to what Sam said, especially if it's an area that maybe another game master might be able to speak to really well, but your personal lived experiences don't allow you, or your, or your uh, education and background don't allow you to be able to, to talk about that. So, so we, we can list out a whole lot of topics, but I think that as a general guideline to help all of you, I think that's a really good place to start. I 
think if we clap back for every answer, we're probably not going to get very far. Yeah, I was like, this is a very polite group. Yeah. Actually, one thing I've been talking about that. Oh, yeah? Yeah, go ahead. So, one thing is actually consider what the system is supporting. Um, the most familiar one for most people with Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeons and Dragons is actually very bad at supporting a lot of different topics. There's some that they can be good at. I love Dungeons and Dragons personally. I love it a lot. But I can recognize its limitations also. There are also some systems that are built with different intentions in mind. One, you can find you for sale actual right now, a uh, jump sheet book, a blank or call. Um, it's built around the experience of Chinese immigrants to the United States and their experience with the Chinese exclusion act. And these are specific things that are structured into the game by its creators to help people understand this. So it's also important to engage with the systems and understand what they are meant to do. Yeah. It's not just who's running the game, it's also who's making the game. Yep. Um, so talking, going back to a point that Adam made about how you and the group needs to set those boundaries, there's a huge conversation, rightfully so, around safety <coughs> tools right now. But I'm wondering what safety tools are good for a younger table, or what safety tools have you adapted for a younger table? Uh, Marianne, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so I'm not the safety tools queen. Uh, I don't, there's probably a lot of opinions on this, uh, but I am a middle school teacher, and I do have to make uh, disparate groups of people work together towards a common goal on a fairly regular basis. <laughs> um, so I think I want to back up and say, well, what are safety tools? And I want to start with, no one's actually a mind reader. And so what safety tools or session zero, all those things are about is, what's going to make this fun for everyone? And, and starting with some of those, what rating is this? Is this PG? Is it G? Is it rated R? Is this a grim dark campaign? Is it whimsical? Are we combat focused? Right, and as an adult who's teaching middle schoolers, there are certain rules that I have to have in place and I'm happy to. But if I say to them, this is like a PG-13, PG mostly campaign, that's gonna give them a different vibe than go hog wild, right? Um, and when I talk about safety tools with kids, I usually start with, we're all gonna have to tell a story together. That's going to be fun. And it needs to be fun for everyone. So if there's something that's you don't want to have in the story because it would make it not fun for you. You just have to tell us. So then we won't have it. And I don't make people say them out loud, but I'll give a Google uh, survey, and I'm not just Google survey, and say, like, here are the things that people asked us not to have in the game. And so a surprise last year was moths. There was one person who didn't like the idea of moths in her face. And so I was like, do you, and that's usually the example I give. So I'm like, do you think we could tell an interesting story without moths? And everyone's like, well, yeah. And I'm like, great. So now we've solved that problem and that person can feel safe, right? And so I think when you say, like, we want this to be fun, and there are some things that are not fun for some people that might not bother you, kids are always very willing to be thoughtful about that. Um, so I think that safety tools are partially like a positionality. I, I don't think any one safety tool is particularly better than another. You have to kind of know your people in your setting. We use an X card. Um, I talked about it in another panel, and now kids run up to each other and go, eh, when something <laughs> is uncomfortable, even outside of the game. But um, it's delightful. Uh, actually, to be real, the health teacher was pretty mad during the therapy lesson. <laughs> she got x carded all over the place. Um, but, so I, I think it breaks down to three things. There's the actual safety tools, the how do I say I'm uncomfortable. But that's not useful if there isn't a culture of being able to use them. Like, yay, we have safety tools. Um, but it starts with, well, what are our expectations of how we treat each other? What is the culture of our table? And then what are the norms which explicitly say how we treat each other and we can all agree to and come back to? So one of ours is actions have consequences in real life and in game. So if a kid is being a really challenging uh, partner, I can say, hey, one of our norms is actions have consequences. I see that your group is really frustrated. I wonder if there's an action that happened that caused this, 
right? But I can also say, hey, every time this NPC tries to talk to you, you punch him in the face. I wonder why he might have burned your map, <laughs> right? And, and so it's that same thing. Uh, so I, I would love to hear what other people have to say um, about this, but for me, it's safety tools and like session zero are like the tip of the iceberg. They're the part you see, but like the rest of the iceberg's under the water and you gotta have that too. Thank you. Any of our other panelists wanna jump in? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just say that safety tools are, are so tough because when you're talking about kids, you're talking about this wide range of ages. You really have to think about the developmental approach of uh, what safety tools going to be appropriate for, say, a four-year-old. Anybody's working with kids that young? Uh, it's the youngest I've ever done RPGs with. And then if you're working with teenagers, you're working with middle schoolers, you're working with uh, elementary schoolers, like it, it is a huge difference trying to choose what safety tools you want to utilize within those those different circumstances. But even a four-year-old understands if you say, um, I, don't, I don't think we're gonna have that in this game. Uh, or we're, we're not gonna play that one. Or to say, what should we have in this game? What should we not have in this game? Um, you can still have all those conversations. There's still a great opportunity to set boundaries. And, and especially, I think that the, the thing that you mentioned um, in there was the um, idea of group norms or, or sort of sort of table, uh, uh, not table rules, but, but table values. You know, what are we all gonna to play together? I think that's a conversation you can have as a, as a group as well. Peter, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I think um, something that like the X card and whatnot do, especially from a young age, is normalize backing up when someone expresses that they're uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I think that as a safety tool that's like, really critical that's something that can apply well into adulthood and so i think uh you know they're, they're not just tools for the table they're tools for growth well and i think that people people are not mind readers these things do not happen by accident and if you look back at even the miscommunications you have with your own friends and family a lot of times you just have different expectations and so if as a table we can establish what the expectations are, or at least start with some ground rules or ground norms, that gives us such an advantage. Because people, otherwise people make mistakes that they don't know are mistakes. And then it becomes incredibly complicated. So the more we can sort of front load that into our culture and then keep talking about it. This isn't a, session zero is a myth. It's session everything, right? <laughs> You can't just do it once and be like, here's our safety tools, because then then it's not really part of your project. Like session every day. Session <laughs> every day. Thank you all so much. Um, so we mentioned in the introduction that there are some myths around role-playing games that maybe make parents a little bit more nervous about what you're doing with their kids. Um, how do you deal with parents who are uncertain about the themes you use or who want different things from what their kids have expressed? Uh, Junie, would you be willing to start us off? Uh, yeah. Uh, since I work in a library, there are many times where I will have um, a kid or a teen in the program and their mom just signed them up for it. They, they didn't know what their mom signed them up for or they're just here because they were told they had to come here and it's Thursday and that's what it is. Um, so there's this uh, fine balance of trying to make it fun for them, but also parents when they sign things up, in, in my specific instance, it's they don't always look into it and it's just a matter of prepping everything. And they may not ask and it may never come up, but just know there will be the time where somebody's gonna ask for those specific themes and you're gonna need that little elevator pitch of what might happen and condensed form, and it'll be more than the kid will ever need to get, but they will need to know. Um, and it's, you have to go, it's, it's gonna be different from context if they're in school, if it's more of a therapeutic se session or something like that. It's, who's this for? Is it for them? Is it because you want them to get out of the house? Are they trying to develop a skill, practice something? Just get into a hobby? Or is it they had, they saw it online and they wanted to get into it, they're, they have friends that talk about it and they want to do it. Um, 
it's it's really knowing your background, what setting this is going to be in, and tailoring everything to that, and just being prepared with what you know. Somebody's going to ask a parent might want the themes, um, but it's also going to be like time frame and just uh, how crunchy the numbers are going to be, and like what's going to be involved. Uh, prep is going to take care of most of that, but being true to where you're doing this is going to really just help you narrow down what you need to talk about with a parent or the kids themselves. Anybody else on our team? Yeah, um, something I run into at least once as far as the idea of you know parents wanting one thing, kid wanting another. Um, Situations where you know, I, I, I run autism groups, and these are you know, largely kind of social groups where we work on, uh, I specifically work on a lot of self advocacy and stuff like that. Um, I'm actually autistic myself, and so that kind of makes it a bit of a pure modeling piece. But I've ha had parents, after a quarter, say, okay, so th this is gonna fix his autism, right? And I'm just like, uh, uh, <laughs> about that, and it's, 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 <laughs> and, and so it's it's something where I was actually uh, talking with uh, Adam about these these situations earlier, and I, I think the the idea of like okay, well, what does success for the kid look like? And asking you know the parents to think about the with the kids, you know what do they want? Um, you know figuring out what their definition of success is because. If success for them looks like, you know what, I made a super geeky friend who is as into particle physics as I am, and this friend is going to be my college roommate, and I'm going to not grow up lonely, then that's success for me, and that's success for the kid. without being free of accountability for their actions. And I think we may have touched on this a bit with the building of norms, but um, if we've got some stuff to add on this, um, Peter, if you'd like to start us off. Yeah, I, I think RPGs are ultimately a sandbox. Now, what the sandbox looks like and the capabilities of it are really dependent on the group. And it could be a sandbox where the extent of it is, okay, I can only move you know, 30, you know, 30 feet per turn, and I can only attack once a turn, and that's all this game is. Or it can be, I can explore being a different gender. Or I can explore different aspects of masking. Um, so I think that discussions around accountability are really dependent on the nature of the group, and what is possible in the group, and what I've been very lucky to have been part of with my groups is that the conversations around accountability are that for the most part there is none because this is a masking sandbox. This is a sandbox where people can try on a bunch of different masks and no one's going to call them weird. They can say, man you're playing a really bizarre character but that, that's kind of cool and it makes sense given that you're you know, a giant talking uh, phoenix from another planet. And um, so that, 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 that lack of sort of accountability that is based around societal norms of what is neuro neurotypical, what is acceptable, I think is uh, very helpful. I guess I would also ask, kind of to echo what Peter's saying is, well, what does that mean? What does accountability mean? To whom? Uh, for what purpose? Right? And I think that the sort of uh, meat of this question is about letting people be who they <clears throat> try out lots of different things. I would, you know, argue that all of us, but especially middle schoolers, are role playing all of the time. <laughs> Except that it's more fun to play role playing game because there's more options and lower stakes, um, <laughs> right? And so I think we make 
the accountability is when you have those norms in that culture where you care about each other. And so when, when we, it's sort of building in safety tools, expectations, norms, and genuine relationship between each other, that's where the accountability comes in. So if somebody is going doing something that makes someone else uncomfortable, they can say that. Um, because I think, I think that's really where the key is, and that's what healthy <coughs> relationships should be outside of the table also, right? And so we're giving them practice, but it's a lot easier to say, hey, your giant phoenix is making me uncomfortable because my character is allergic to feathers, and we're in the same time as space capsule, and you move over. That might be a lot easier to practice doing that than to say to my, my one friend that I really love, hey, can you give me somebody's face? Right? So we're allowing practicing to happen. And I think there is accountability as long as there's sort of healthy table culture built on some of the things we've already talked about. Absolutely. I know Jimmy has something to say, and that's him. Just real quick, because it, it kind of ties back to parents. Uh, yeah. it, um, one thing that uh, I, I think about literally setting the space in that um, when it's you're in a school, it's them with their friends and you, and you're putting yourself in this very specific role. If you're just doing the storytelling right, it's almost like you're not in it. Um, but it's different if you are right there and mom's right over there. Even though we put it in a session that we wouldn't do anything that would be inappropriate or anything like that, this is where a library or a school are at, they don't have that freedom because they can't escape. They know that there's somebody there that just, you know, you know, what, a, what am I going to say or do? But it's just me and you, just us. We're in this world together. It could be a classroom. It could be a nice, like, event room. But if you are at a cafeteria table and there's people all around, even though they're not paying attention to you, that still that environment isn't set for them to explore, hold each other. You know, it's, you're making the setting to help them, for setting them up for success with what they're going in. <laughs> holding each other accountable and progressing like that. So. Absolutely. Sam? Actually, I can hear you. Oh, sorry. I have some thoughts about this one. Uh, and, and some questions. I, I look at this question. How do we make spaces that are safe for exploration without being free of accountability? And I see two parts. How do we make spaces that are safe for exploration of a number of different things? Uh, who we are, what we feel, uh, who we might want to become, what kind of game we want to play. And I think this panel has done a really great job of covering how we create safe spaces to explore different concepts. But the second half of that question, without being free of accountability, I find really interesting because I think that depending on how we are thinking about accountability and what perspective we're taking, it's going to change the answer. So uh, what I've heard so far, I think Peter spoke to this, um, free, uh, without being free of accountability for how I, how I feel, I want to express myself. Uh, what kind of uh, version of me do I want to embody? Uh, that's really cool. But when we're thinking about behaviors, I don't want to create a space that's uh, free of accountability. I actually want to build accountability into my games more. Um, I want to be able to play with the experience of breaking a rule and learning about the consequences in a space that's actually sp like safe to receive a consequence. If uh, my players are tasked with removing a spider infestation from a home, and they go about doing that by burning the home to the ground, <laughs> they did a great job of getting rid of all the spiders, but they might have really uh, rubbed the homeowner or the town the wrong way, and they may need to uh, pay for that one way or another. They may be in trouble. They, they may be uh, chased down by uh, the, the sheriff. We may have to go to prison. What do we do about that? How do we serve our turn? How do we like make it up to the town or the homeowner? Um, we do need to be held accountable for our behavioral actions, the choices that we make. And that's not inherently a bad thing. That's a really cool thing to get to play with. I think there's a, a piece with in-game accountability versus table accountability. So in-game accountability is, okay, you, you burn down the house, the, 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 the parties, you know, a bunch of arsonists. Yeah, they're gonna go to jail. 
Um, however, a kid gets frustrated with another kid and yells at him or does something really mean to his character because of it or you know, what have you, the safety tools provide that accountability. I think that's, that's where there's that delineation between the end game consequences where you know, it's still the, the, the end game and the taking it back to the table to create that safe space. Absolutely. So what is your role in all of this? How do you present yourself as a supporter, a helper, and a resource while these kids are exploring, instead of, as is often found in schools, um, an authoritarian a lecturer or a judge, the person who's there to tell them whether they're right or wrong? Um, and Judy, if you'd like to start us off. Uh, I am not a teacher. Uh, it's it, a, a library is 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 a is a fun magical place, um, and everybody that works there is a librarian, whether they are or not. That's just the the perception a lot of the time. Um, so it's it's this role where we're we're in a teacher like authority role because we're the adult. But we're not that, so it's it's remembering that and kind of like leaning into it because you can. I don't want to say like I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a teacher, so I don't know if I'm like I'm to try to hold myself to a certain like I have to carry myself this way. I'm a teacher. I don't have that pressure. Uh -oh. uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, I uh oh, geez. I lost track of thought. There we go. Um, I I do my I do as much to take myself out of it and make it like narrative enough where they feel like it's not me doing this anymore it's the story it's them they get mad at the butcher not me i am the butcher but that's not the way it is right now and get them to interact with each other do more of the collaborative storytelling element of things um i found out that i was dming gming a few years ago because for years i have been leading book discussions doing uh, teen programs playing Werewolf or other games that I didn't realize that I was doing a collaborative storytelling element. So I was DMing and jamming in TTRPGs is the one time I shuffled it all together. And um, we've talked about safety tools so many times and I've only recently started really trying to get actual safety tools because I was doing everything reflexively. I was doing things passively. I was reading signs, seeing that somebody was uncomfortable to know when to change something um, instead of giving them the tools to do it like in case I missed something. I was going off of experience, but there's tools now um, and finding the right ones that work for your group. It's not a one size fits all. Some people are more verbal, some people are more, they need the tan to like, I'm going to steal this idea. Like, I'm very, you know, <laughs> but and, uh, because. Take but, I will. Um, but some people won't. I, I know teams that won't want to do this because it will draw attention to them even if it's they don't see. If they don't have to show it, they just show you, they don't want to be the guy to, to do it. So it's finding the right one that is going to work for your group, whether it's age or just culture of the table, that are older, like, you know, I don't, know, I don't do that. I don't want to be one to complain. It's finding the right thing. Uh, I take myself out of it. That's personally how I do it. And then they kind of place themselves. I try to make teachable moments when I can, and they kind of fall into it. Those are the most magical moments. But uh, I know that a teacher or somebody that's doing this in a more uh, targeted fashion is going to have a have to approach it in a completely different way um, and have a completely different expectation. I have people that sometimes don't want to be there, don't want to role play, and I have to almost trick them uh, without betraying their trust, but getting them to accidentally fall into that space where I'll make the uh, slight uh, the slight uh, judgment of like saying, oh, you want to buy that? Okay, so you just go and say, give me that. I know they won't say that, but maybe I'll use a little harsher tone or something, and they'll go, no, 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 I don't, not like that. I'm like, no, what, then how do you say it? What words, and without realizing it, they roll late. They, they did it themselves, and now they know when they go back to that shopkeeper and they want a sandwich, and I was like, oh, you want there? He's like, yeah, I want this, and they just fall into it. And it's that magical, I, I always 
I always try to treat every program I do in a library. What this is so dope that I wish I was I had somebody like that to show me how dope this was when I was 10, 12, 15, whatever. I want to give them those moments because we, if you've been playing for a long time, you've had the moment where you first defeat a monster, first uh, trick somebody, uh, do something. They haven't. They haven't had those moments yet, and you can give them those moments uh, or, or make them teachable moments to, and how they can relate to other aspects because they will, they have, they'll learn new ways to interact with each other, with you know how to express feelings and. Um, and there's, kids are smart. <laughs> Kid, kids can handle a lot, and uh, you don't have to spell it out, um, but you can put it there, and they can take it a lot of the time. So I was thinking about the, the question about the balance between or presenting yourself as a supporter and not an authoritarian. If you're in some type of group where, like it's a social skills group, or there is some built-in authority uh, just because of the nature of your role as the DM and as a professional. I think you will still need to be an authoritarian on around certain pieces, but the way to mitigate that is to give the kids a lot of agency. Do the yes and, yes but, etc. And I think by having that high degree of agency that they have, if you do it right, the kids will trust you when you need to act and trust you to keep things safe if you need to. And I actually had a situation where one of the kids uh, decided, he kind of half told the rest of the party that he was gonna you know, reveal himself to be a, a, a turncoat and he didn't exactly make it clear. So suddenly he cast an eldritch blast at another kid and the rest of the group was like, what? I, I thought this was not really a violent campaign. What, what, why are you doing this? And the kid was super, super freaked out. He was realizing he had just done a huge social faux pas. He was freaking out. I had an NPC suddenly teleport him away, turned it into a comical situation where he became a lobster in a modern supermarket. He loved it. He's <laughs> probably the only kid I know that would love that and for his character. Um, he's currently in another modern world uh, NPC's uh, bathtub. And they're doing a live blog about the, the bathtub lobster. But anyways, um, <laughs> bathtub lobsters aside, uh, several kids reached out to me uh, in private and said, "Thank you for de-escalating that. I, I thank thank you for doing that." And the kids all trusted me to give me that agency to do that. Um, the other the other place I think that comes from is if I'm autistic and my co-facilitator. I, you know, I, we have two facilitators for, for game, is autistic. And she actually is a former student of the program that I eventually hired. And her lived experience and her kind of being able to speak to having been to those groups, I think creates a lot of a sense of uh, peer facilitation. I think that is really, really important. And if you are running a group with a population where you might not, you know, know their lived experience, even if it's, you know, you're just working with autistic kids and you're not autistic yourself. If you can hire somehow an autistic co-facilitator, they will pick up on things that you're going to just straight up miss. So, yeah. Um, I actually just want to add like a little layer of frosting to the to the beautiful cake from from all those stories to prove that this looks like stories. I think the thing that uh, exists in all of those is a willingness to play. Uh, one of the things that, that you're going to do, you're working with kids. Uh, there's sometimes a temptation that you are an adult. You have to stay an adult. Uh, you can't get down on your hands and knees and be a kitty cat with the other kids in the room. Uh, you got to dictate the story or you got to do the other things. You can't speak in funny voices. And I'm gonna tell you that that is the wrong direction to go. You've gotta play with them. And one of the things that, that a lot of facilitators forget is that you're part of the game. Uh, whether you like it or not, you are a player in the game. You just have a different set of roles, a different set of tools. And you do sometimes have to set some boundaries. Sometimes you have to stand up and say, oh, we're getting into a place where we gotta be careful because this might, might be difficult to do. But for the most part, you're gonna be there. You should use that play always as a tool. 
the story that Peter just told with the, the lobster in the, in the supermarket is a perfect example of, of let's, the play is going to continue. Let's use the play as a way to, to diffuse all of this and remember that what we're doing here is we're, we're playing and we're having a good time. Uh, my uh, uh, business partner, Adam Davis, does this thing that I absolutely love. He stays in character as a character, even when players are trying to describe what it is that they're trying to do. So we had a group of players that were about seven, six or seven, very young. And, uh, and the, the, Adam was the shopkeeper, he was the soup maven, which if anybody knows any of the Game of Grove games, we have a lot of soup mavens. Uh, and he said, oh, welcome, have, here, come, come in, have a good time. And one of the players goes, I punched him. And then he goes, who are you punching? <laughs> who are you doing that? And he goes, no, 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 I punch him, I go like this. And he goes, oh, like a fist bump. Yes, that's a fist bump, that's perfect, that's a fist bump. And he goes, no, 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 I'm trying to punch him. And he goes, I don't know who you're talking to. <laughs> and this is the thing you're talking to here. And being able to do that, stay in character, make it a playful experience, that, that is a huge part of you being there, you being, you're not an authoritarian, you're not just the judge, you're not, you're not the jury, you are, you are someone playing the game right along with us. I would like to build on a couple of those points. Uh, but like, what a lovely story, I don't know if you like that. Um, both Adam and Peter mentioned uh, the importance of being kind of flexible, setting boundaries, engaging in play to de-escalate. And um, I'm kind of holding all of those in my head and I'm looking at the question, how do you present yourself as a support, a helper, or a resource instead of an authoritarian lecturer or judge? And my immediate knee-jerk reaction was, oh, I'm going to be presenting myself as both and neither. And I'd like to explain what that means. Um, the relationship I have with my players, whether it is a therapeutic game or like a home game with people my age, younger, older, uh, this is a collaborative experience. As a therapist or as a game master, I have a certain knowledge set that might make me an expert on certain areas, and I'm not gonna be an expert on everything. Some of my players are gonna be experts on things that I am not, including uh, a particular rule set from like an obscure part of players and both to themselves. They're always gonna know themselves better than me. Um, I'm going to be an authoritarian at some point. As the game master, I have to make, uh, I have to play the function of arbiter uh, in a lot of situations. Uh, and I also want to be a support for when I like, but a support of what? When I look at uh, almost anything, I'm, I, my answer is it depends. <laughs> I don't want anyone in this room to trust me. I think that's a very vague and dangerous concept. <laughs> <laughs> what I, what I, what I want to see happen is you get more specific, more persnickety about language. I want you to trust me to do something in specific or not trust me to do something in specific. Uh, I want you to trust me if you ask me a question, you want to know my opinion, you can trust me to give you a, a direct and honest answer. I feel pretty good about putting that on offer. You should not trust me to take out your appendix. <laughs> I'm not good at that. <laughs> you don't know you're good, though. Fair enough. There's no evidence So this game that we're playing, it's a collaborative experience, and a lot of what I want to do with my players is define the nature of our relationship. What are our roles? What am I supporting you towards or helping you with? What goals do you have as a player or as a parent that we can collaboratively move towards at your pace and comfort level? Um, as a therapist, if someone comes to me with a specific phobia, I'm afraid of spiders. I know what to do. The best solution for fear is exposure, but I'm not going to just arbitrarily cover you in spiders and you stop being afraid of spiders. Um, that could work, it's just very cruel. We're going to be collaborative. We're going to come up with what our end point is and what the stair step approach is going to be to get us from point A to point B. Where do you even buy that? <laughs> I'm just going to let's, buy the uh, store. Let's not get into that as much as possible. Because we have about 15 minutes left, and I would like to try and get to the point where we get to have people ask questions. Um, I did have one last question on our thing, and I know that Sam has been uh, ready to answer it this entire panel, so I want to touch on it really quickly. Um, 
We've talked a lot about the safety tools and the ways to prevent things from getting bad, but we've also talked about how we have to deal with some things reflexively. So how do you address it when a kid has trouble with tough content? Gets a phobia, gets in an argument, or a character dies? Yeah, so um, I have two examples of that, actually, just to know the thing probably about one of these. But um, I got an email, actually, not that long ago, that was, we'll call him um, Jeremy. Jeremy is scared. That's the song I got. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> That's not a subject line I wanted to see. So I'm like, hearing the worst, I open this up and I find out that uh, one of my players is actually having a big fear reaction to the current arc we were in. Or at least I thought it was the current arc we were in. It actually wasn't. Um, and you know, what can we do about that? So I talked with them about, well, clearly we're not going to just dump them into this fear boat because I'm not a psychotherapist for one thing. I'm not qualified to try to mitigate that. If I was, this wouldn't be the uh, space to do it in. Um, so what can we do about the fear that we're facing now? So there are ways that we can handle that. And there's a lot of things, especially from the approach of playing with kids, that you need to learn. One is pull back the curtain when necessary. You don't need to do this Wizard of Oz nonsense. Um, so, you know, what I did is I scheduled some time to sit down with Jeremy and I talked to them about, you know, what was actually going on. And, you know, so like, well, you can't just tell them your teacher. Yeah, sure, I can. It's not hard. I'm like, okay, Jeremy, here's the sequence. Um, and because I do that, it removes some of the deceit and some of that unknown that is causing some of the fear. And that helps. I also um, point out ways that, you know, it seems like, well, it seems like your character was like interested in this, but you were playing hard into the, the fear. Let's talk about that. Uh, well, I thought if I couldn't touch things, I was like, Jeremy, you're a wizard, and I put you in a wizard style. You're like better than everybody in here. I, I don't want to stress that point too much around them, but it's true. <laughs> um, and you know, so comes back, and uh, it turns out that he actually wasn't having a problem with the, the current arc we were in. He was having a problem with the arc we had been. But still, that talk helped him engage better with the, the topics going forward and figure out where he was comfortable being. Or he was not comfortable being. And to also realize that if he had a problem, I wasn't going to hand wave away, I wasn't going to push back, I wasn't going to say, well, how scared is he really? I was going to say, he's scared, we're going to address it right now. We're going to put on the brakes and find an answer. Because I'm not trying to dismiss what is definitely a real concern. The other one I asked from way earlier is that a character who died. And uh, they were like just. Unfortunately, I think I am going to cut you off on the other one. Um, there are miles more that we could handle in that question alone, but I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. Um, we had our two ways of asking, but before you stand up at the mic, I would like to set a couple of ground rules. We want to get through as many questions as possible. Please keep your questions short and to the point. We gave our panelists five words to introduce themselves. I'm going to ask you to aim for the same. Secondly, please make sure your question is for the panel, not for one specific panelist. Most of us will be outside in the hall immediately afterwards if you have a question for just one of us. Thirdly, we'll be alternating questions from the mic and questions submitted online to try and get through both of them. Please be patient with us. And finally, keep your questions appropriate. If you are using the mic for bigotry or invasions of our panelists' privacy, you will find me escorting you to the door faster than a step to the wind. Go ahead and line up if you want to ask a question. <laughs> So I think the first thing is, it takes time and it takes effort. 
and they are working with less of a developed prefrontal cortex than you, less life experience, and less positional authority as not the adult. So you have to set them up with a lot of skills, a lot of, you know, directly, hmm, your group's running around. I wonder if they might need a break, right? And so just, I, I think a lot of direct instruction. There are always going to be some kids who are natural storytellers and have more sort of natural leadership, right? Or, or personal gravitas for whatever reason. You know those kids from middle school. Um, and if we can get them to sort of bring that into something positive, that's awesome. But it's not easy. I don't think there's one particular answer other than really sitting down and listening to what the struggles are they're having as leaders and helping them by supporting their positional authority. You know, I am the authoritative and authoritarian person in my group because that way if they're going to be mad at someone, they're going to be mad at me. And that, you know, the GM can be like, I don't know, you know how she is. I'm like, that's right, everyone's going to stop throwing dice, you know, <laughs> right? Or whatever. So. So I think it depends on your setting. Uh, I'm sorry that it's kind of a messy answer, but I think it's a really a messy question because we're talking about how do we develop people as leaders. So. Okay, I think you have to Real fast, uh, if, if you're in a position that you can decrease the barrier of entry for them, that you can, the starter set is 15 bucks, sometimes there's a lot of things, you, but like I work in the library, we have copies of the player's handbook, the DM guide, sets of dice that they can use there, dry erase maps, things like, certain things because there are sometimes this argument that D&D or other tutorial use, it is free and doesn't need anything, or you need 15 books and this many minutes and dice in order to play, or learn, or do anything. In order to be a DM, you need three books. That isn't the case, but if, any, if you're ever in a position where it's just like, I wish I, I want a DM, I just wish I knew more monsters, and you can have a, a dungeon master guide or a monster manual that they can reference, that, that, that gives them tools that they can at least try. Because I work in an urban library where there's a lot of people that can't. So whatever you're able to do to set them up Printing character sheets, just having character sheets on scrap paper that they can take. All those little things help them to kind of move forward where they might not have been able to before. Absolutely. And, sorry, I'm going to cut in here. Uh, start with safety. The rest can be fumbled and recovered much more easily. And I would like to get to our next question. Yeah, so we got uh, really great ones from online. We're going to start actually with our own. Really tough one that I think our game girl folks might have something to say. Uh, what if a child decides to role play as a character that is reflective of some of the negative and hurtful experiences that they have faced in their life? How can we mitigate conflict and teach accountability without discouraging them to explore those experiences from another perspective? You want to feel that? No, I want to like look at that and roll that over and not do that, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, Boy, that's a complicated question. Mm -hmm. Some, somebody wants to bring in something into the game and it's been something that, that they've struggled with in their life. Um, this is all about safety. And this is all about your back, background and the context in which you're providing us. If you're doing a, so the, the, the real answer, and this honestly is probably the answer across the board for all of the stuff that we talked about, it depends. <laughs> Um, but this is really about, about setting appropriate safety boundaries, both for you as a facilitator, are you prepared to, to dive into the important parts of what this player may be experiencing? It is absolutely, unbelievably crucial that you never uh, put a player back into a trauma that they've already experienced within their life. Don't do that within the context of their character, that is not an appropriate way to, to handle or to uh, go about the the therapeutic approach for trauma, so just keep all of those things in mind. There's so much to this question, but I think the biggest piece that I would say is the most important part of it is um, it's okay to set a boundary with your player and to say, this is as far as we can go in this game. But I want to encourage you that we can, we can have more conversations or I can point you to a, a resource that, that can give you an opportunity to talk more about. Especially in protecting the rest of the group. 
I think it's important to clarify that we're not saying nothing interesting or bad can happen in the story. Because, right, a story that's like once upon a time, nothing happened and everyone got along the end is a terrible story. It's like Tuesday afternoon or something, you know, whatever you like, hopefully. Um, so there's a difference between kids having challenging things in the game and trauma. I, I do have something to say, and I think I can do it in like 30 seconds. I can talk really fast and finally what I want to say. And uh, I want to just focus on like how and why we are addressing these things. Um, there should be a function to bringing in something distressing and complicated. Uh, we, we just talked about conflict being interesting in and of itself. Um, and how is that safe for the player? Is it safe for the other players at the table? Does that make me as the game master come? A specific example that I have in my head isn't really related to my work with kids, it's related to my work with the VA. When I worked with a Vietnam veteran who was distressed at storms because there were significant periods of his time during the war when he was in like monsoons and heavy rains and it was really a distressing time. Um, and so how and why did we want to play with that and address that in the narrative? He wanted to make a cleric who was a Tempest cleric. He wanted to like take some ownership of the thing that made him scared. We didn't have to put him into that situation. We gave him tools to play with that and change his relationship to the stimuli that upset him. Thank you. Uh, our next question at the mic. Um, so in balancing safety, which you want to ensure, and but also encouraging people to take risks, how do you set a, how do you, sorry, how do you set a shame-free environment so that kids can try things and know if they do something wrong, but that can also be an okay, like learning opportunity. Ooh, I, I, I will often be the biggest book in the room. And uh, that may sound silly, but like one of the ways that I try to make a change environment is that I try to show the kids that I am not infallible. That um, I have my own boundaries and that I can be transparent about those. And that some of them are, you know, like, gonna feel like the moralistic boundaries of society should play. Some of them are just gonna be like, ah, oh, really? We gotta talk about that. Uh, why is everybody so obsessed with chocolate? <laughs> and um, you can do these things. You can also create areas where I will basically present myself either through NPCs or through my own um, sometimes falsified uh, inaction or like uh, mistakes or whatever as. Um, you know, an object that could be an object of ridicule. But they're like, oh, why would we? You know, they, they kind of see through the model. You can model for them what it looks like to, to own yourself, to be yourself, but also to um, treat others respectfully. Um, and another way that I'll do that is I'll praise people for what might seem like bad choices to other players. Like, I don't love that you own that choice. That was amazing. I love that you stuck to it. Look at what came out of it. Look at how the story turned. It's incredible. I know. Session number two. Yeah, oh, yeah. Every time? Of course. I'm no sorry. session two. Session two. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Was it everything or every time? Uh, session everything? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, our next question? All right, so we got, uh, yeah, we've got like one more. Okay, we've got one minute to answer this, so we're going to go fast on this one. So, yeah, these are a lot of alcohol. I'll be living on Twitter to answer one we don't get to. Um, how do you recommend dealing with the aftermath of peer run sessions that poorly address difficult topics? Anyone? <laughs> well, hopefully, you don't get yourself into that situation, especially with all the things we just asked you to do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's right. A, a pinch of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But I think, honestly, by talking about it and sitting down and being honest and saying, oh, that didn't go so well. Having an open door policy going, hey, always starting with after, if anything, if you don't feel like talking about it now, just see me afterwards and we'll make sure that for next time we can address it or rectify it or whatever the situation is. because. There's always going to be somebody that doesn't want to speak up sometimes, and just always making that aware that that's an option for them. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
setting up those norms and tools ahead of time it gives them the power to talk about these things when they don't go so well. And with that, we are out of time. Thank you, everyone.